Hello, this is Ms. Moore, and today during chemistry we're going to discuss polarity and bond type. So the central question, what determines the type of bonds different atoms will form? All right, let's try this. So we're going to go back and talk a minute about electronegativity. And so, why do some combinations of atoms form ions and some combinations form covalent bonds? This question can be answered with the idea of electronegativity. Whether a combination of atoms forms ions or covalent bonds depends on the electronegativities of the atoms involved. Remember, electronegativity is the ability to steal electrons, right? Stronger nucleus, more able to steal electrons, and also less able to be stolen from. Predicting the type of bond that forms. The larger the difference in electronegativity, the more the stronger atom will pull the electrons. And if the difference is great enough, the stronger atom will steal, right? So ionic bonds are formed when the electronegativity difference is very great. And when does that happen? That happens when one atom is a metal and one atom is a nonmetal. So remember, metals are to the left of the jaggedy line. So all of these guys and these guys. And one atom is a non-metal. And the non-metals are to the right of the jaggedy line. So these guys here. Okay, and you're in this case, if you're a pink guy, you're really, really strong, and you can totally steal electrons from the yellow guys. So if you have somebody in the yellow range, a metal, and somebody in the pink range, a non-metal, you're going to end up with an ionic bond because of the great difference in electronegativity. All right, onward to covalent bonds. Remember, in a covalent bond, electrons are being shared between two atoms. Okay, and we have two different types of covalent bonds. The first type we're going to talk about is called the polar covalent bond. And a polar covalent bond is formed when one atom is stronger than another, but not quite strong enough to steal it. So they're sharing the electrons, but maybe not quite equally. And we'll talk later about um, what that means for a molecule or a covalent compound when it's polar. But for now, just know that they're sharing electrons, but not quite evenly. Okay. Now, when you have a polar covalent bond, both atoms are going to be nonmetals, but they will not be touching each other on the periodic table. Okay, this is sort of a shortcut way to figure out if a bond is polar covalent. So let's try that. So let's say, for example, we had the compound CO2. So if we, find, if we locate the carbon on the periodic table, it's right there, and we locate an oxygen, it's right there. Those two are both nonmetals, but they are not touching each other on the periodic table. So they are bonded in a polar covalent bond. Now, just so there are no mistakes here, if I had something like NaCl, we have Na and Cl. They're not touching, but they're not both nonmetals, right? This would be ionic, or this one would be polar covalent. Okay. So to continue discussing polar covalent bonds, the further they are from each other on the periodic table we're talking about, the more polar the bond will be. Because remember, um, electronegativity increases going across, decreases going down, and so the, the, the greater distance between the two on the periodic table, the greater the different difference in electronegativity or strength. So the electrons will be closer to the stronger atom. So that stronger atom will end up with a partial negative charge, and the weaker atom will end up with a po partial positive charge. Now, that doesn't really change anything for making simple molecules or simple compounds, but the way compounds interact, which we'll talk about later, will partially depend on if it's a polar molecule or not. Okay. 
on to the second type of covalent bond, and that is the nonpolar covalent bond. Nonpolar covalent bonds are formed when there is either no or very little difference in the electronegativities. So a nonpolar covalent bond could be formed if two of the same atom is joined together. For example, Cl2. Okay, we're talking about just Cl2 by itself, or F2, or O2. Those are all nonpolar covalent bonds. I am not talking about a situation like NO2. Okay, that's not what I mean. I mean if we just have this. Okay, and by the way, when you have a molecule that's just made up of two atoms of the same, like Cl2, F2, O2, you call that molecular chlorine, molecular fluorine, molecular oxygen. All right. Another way you can get a nonpolar covalent bond is if two atoms are right next to each other on the periodic table. They're bonded together and they're touching off the periodic table. So, example would be like SCl2. We've got the S and the Cl. Those are definitely touching. Okay, how about... Um, C, <laughs> P, oh, um, well, let's use those, C and P. Because they're touching on the corners, they're still touching. Okay? All right, I want to spend a moment talking about hydrogen. Um, hydrogen's a little funny. Okay, sometimes he, he lives here. Um, mostly he's written there because of his electron configuration. But for bonding purposes, for now, hydrogen lives here. Okay, so you guys can draw that on your periodic table. You can have hydrogen living on top above boron. Um, and we'll talk later about when hydrogen's here for bonding purposes and when he's here. For now, we will just have hydrogen for bonding purposes live on, on top of boron, okay? So um, why is that important? Well, let's say I had a molecule like C, CH4. What kind of bond is that, ionic or covalent? It's going to be covalent because they're both in the nonmetal range, right? Remember, for now, uh, hydrogen lives above boron. And is it polar or nonpolar? Well, carbon and hydrogen are touching corners, so that would be a nonpolar covalent compound. Okay? All right, that's it for today. See you tomorrow.